So welcome everyone, bienvenidos to today's training called In Case You Missed It. Um, this is a training where we'll review highlights from the RFP related trainings we've been offering and then offer a lot of opportunities for questions and discussion. I'm Nicole Young and I'm one of the local consultants that facilitates this countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or Core Investments along with Nicole Lezen and Crystal Caballero. And Crystal and I are your hosts today. And today's session is held in English with Spanish interpretation. Uh, Gisela Carrasco is providing consecutive interpretation right now and will also translate the written comments and questions in the chat. And soon we'll switch to simultaneous interpretation provided by Stella Lauerman. And as you are doing that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Crystal who will give us an overview of CORE. Thank you, Nicole, and good morning, everybody. So CORE, which stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments is a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being for all people across the lifespan in Santa Cruz County. CORE has evolved over several years based on input and insights that have been gathered from many partners in local government, philanthropy, nonprofit, and community groups. And this collaborative process has led to the core mission and vision with equity at the center. And when we say equitable health and well being, we mean that all people across the lifespan have equitable opportunities to experience these eight interdependent core conditions for health and well being, and that people's opportunities and life outcomes aren't predictable for better or for worse by their race, ethnicity, income, gender identity, sexual orientation, immigration status, zip code, or other social identities. So as both a funding model and a movement, CORE helps provide a framework to align priorities, programs, policies, funding, and results around community-wide goals and work together to create the core conditions for health and well-being. And you can see that equity is at the center of this diagram to illustrate that we have to examine and address our individual organizational and systemic beliefs, practices, and structures that perpetuate the very inequities we are determined to eliminate. The County Board of Supervisors adopted this equity statement you see here. Equity in action in Santa Cruz County is a transformative process that embraces individuals of every status, providing unwavering support, dignity, and compassion. Through this commitment, the county ensures intentional opportunities and access, fostering an environment where everyone can thrive. In regards to the core RFP, this is how equity is defined in the glossary, and this is found on page 49. Fairness or justice in the, in the way people are treated, specifically freedom from bias or favoritism. A program built on equity will address the needs of specific populations most likely to be affected by inequities by providing resources and opportunities such that they may thrive alongside other residents in the county. And events like today's training are offered as part of the Core Institute for Innovation and Impact. So you can think of the Core Institute as the learning arm of Core Investments offering an array of training, technical assistance, and other learning opportunities for people across sectors to build the knowledge, skills, and systems needed to fulfill our collective vision of an equitable, thriving, resilient community. Okay, so diving into the content of today's training, we wanted to start with a little poll. And we're asking, what stage of grant writing are you in? So maybe you're contemplating, reviewing the RFP, thinking about application, haven't quite started yet. 
Maybe you're in the beginning, early stages of planning, started some rough draft questions, responses to questions. Maybe you're well on your way in progress, have a game plan, have started um, drafting some responses, or maybe you're finishing up. You've completed your first draft and you're working on editing. So we see some responses coming in. Thanks for, for adding those. We'll give you just another moment here before we close the poll. Looks like responses have slowed down. Seeing. So I'll go ahead and end it, Crystal, and then you can mm -hmm. describe the results. All right, so it looks like most of us are in the beginning or in progress phase. And if some of us have are still contemplating, thinking about it. Not, I would have been surprised if uh, some of us were finishing up. I would have given you a nice round of applause. Good job. All right, thank you, everybody. So here's our plan for today's training. We already just, we just did the overview of core. Um, in just a moment, Nicole will uh, provide an overview of the core RFP and training highlights from the past several trainings that have been conducted about the core RFP. We have some tips for crossing the finish line, and then we have time for your questions and to talk about next steps. Um, we encourage you to please share your questions and comments in the chat along the way, as Nicole uh, mentioned, so that we can keep track of your questions and return to them later. Um, or as they come up. And we will, we do want you to know that we will share the links to the video recording and the, and the bilingual slides in a follow-up email. It usually takes a few days to prepare the videos and ensure everything we're posting on the core website meets all of the Americans with Disability Act accessibility standards. So with that, I'll pass it back to Nicole. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to do a very brief overview of the RFP itself, just to make sure everyone knows where to find information. Um, and it's also how we have structured several of the trainings that we've been offering. So um, this will be brief, um, but just wanted to make sure that everyone knows that there are a couple of different places where you can find the request for proposals, the RFP. You can either find it on the county's website, the General Services Department page. Um, and if you have looked there recently, you'll see that three addenda have been posted. Um, there was one on June 27th that had some revisions uh, noted to the RFP process and schedule. So they were minor changes, nothing that really would alter the way you would go about preparing your application, but just could be helpful to be aware of. There was another one posted on July 3rd that had um, just some changes or corrections to the fiscal year dates that were listed in the budget template and the leveraging template. Um, so those are just uh, wanted to make sure everyone had those corrections. And then the latest one on July 10th was a revision to the leveraging example in the leveraging template and some of the notes and instructions just to clarify that um, when you see the, the, the phrase core contribution in the leveraging template, that that amount should be the same amount as your grand total in the budget template. So we'll review that more specifically when we get to that part in today's training where we're doing a, a recap of everything. But I uh, just wanna point those out because those are helpful to, uh, to know kind of what's changed or what has been corrected since the RFP was first released. HSD, the Human Services Department, has also set up a web page specifically for this three-year core investments funding cycle. That page is a bit of an easier one-stop shop to find all the information and the documents you need, including the RFP, all the uh, templates that you can download, uh, as well as the addenda. So just know that that's there as well. And HSD did post, they've now posted two rounds of questions and answers. Their last document they posted on July 8th is the kind of cumulative set of questions and answers. So if you haven't looked at that yet, 
Uh, I would definitely recommend going to HSD's website. You have to kind of scroll down until you find uh, find that. And uh, because chances are someone has asked a question that you might be wondering about as well, and you'll find an answer there from HSD. Also want to just, again, uh, highlight some key dates to remember leading up to the application due date. We are providing training and technical assistance right up until the, the applications are due. So definitely encourage all of you to make, make use of that. Um, again, as I just mentioned, HSD posted the second questions and answers document on July 8th. Um, and applications are due in less than a month on August 2nd. And as I mentioned, uh, we're providing training in TA throughout the application period. We've been offering these structured trainings where we actually present content and resources and tips. All of those have been um, offered in English with simultaneous Spanish interpretation. They've been recorded. We post the recordings and all the materials on the core resources webpage. So today is actually the last of the structured trainings. Um, and so we're just doing a, again, kind of a recap and refresher of everything that we've covered so far. So that if you're looking for specific information or want some guidance in a particular area, hopefully this will give you a sense of what could be available. The more informal office hours, um, those have already passed. We did two sets of those. Uh, each one focusing on a specific core condition. Those were not recorded because they were uh, very informal, no, you know, no official content or presentation offered as part of that. We are still offering the individualized technical assistance sessions up to two sessions per application. Um, so if you have not yet signed up for TA, this is the time to do it while we still have space available. And I would encourage you to sign up, even if you're not entirely sure what your questions are, like if you feel like you're still so early in your contemplation or brainstorming process that you're not really sure what you even want help with, I would still encourage you to sign up for a TA session just so we can get you uh, on the calendar. Um, several other applicants have used their first session to do some brainstorming, really use us as thought partners and helping kind of refine their thinking about uh, what direction they want to go. So I just do want to mention that, you know, we, we as the core consultants, Nicole Lezen, Crystal and I, we can't tell you, you know, whether you should apply or what core condition to apply under or how you should design your programs. But we really are here to, to try to offer as much guidance as we can on key concepts and tools that are mentioned in the RFP. And we really are here to be a resource for you. So we won't be involved in identifying or selecting the panelists who will be reviewing and scoring the proposals. We actually won't even be reading or scoring applications at all. We won't see them. We won't be involved in any of those discussions or decisions about the funding recommendations. Uh, we do have a colleague, Jane Conklin, who is another member of our core team. And so she will be supporting the county and the city of Santa Cruz in that part of the process. But again, Nicole, Crystal, and I will not be directly involved in anything having to do with the funding recommendations. So we really want to be able to be, again, uh, present and, and good thought partners for all of you. Okay, this slide here is just showing the, it's, uh, the key kind of sections or components of the application that you'll be uh, preparing and the, the number of points assigned to each of those sections. We've summarized them here on this slide, and this is also what we use to kind of roughly follow and kind of focus on uh, in each of the trainings that we designed um, to kind of highlight and really provide, again, provide some resources and tools as you're kind of completing each of the sections of the application. This slide here that I'm showing is just the uh, kind of scoring scale in the scoring rubric. Um, there is a more detailed document in the RFP. We really encourage you to, to check that out, study it, print it out, do whatever you need to do. Um, you know, and to keep referring back to it as you are filling out your applications or preparing your draft responses so that you can kind of basically think like a reviewer. 
uh, as you're drafting your responses, then look at, okay, if I were a reviewer and I were looking for a, an exemplary response, what are the elements or the pieces that I would be looking for? And then that uh, can help you with identifying what parts of your responses might need to be tweaked or strengthened. Okay, and then here I'm going to uh, turn it back to Crystal. Thank you, Nicole. So I've been having some connectivity issues. So if I become inaudible, please let me know. Um, okay, so the this RFP focuses on specific core conditions for health and well-being and specific impact statements within those core conditions. Um, there will be a separate process to award funds uh, for stable, affordable housing and shelter, which is one of the four prioritized core conditions, and we still don't have any details about that. Um, the other three are healthy environments, lifelong learning and education, and thriving families. Um, in the RFP, there are several questions that ask you to describe inequities, needs, challenges, strengths your program design, activity, and outcomes, and to specifically connect your responses back to the core condition and impact statement you are, that, that you selected and that you're seeking to influence through your program um, or proposal. Each of these core conditions, um, like I mentioned, um, has three to five uh, community level impact statements. And the core condition themselves uh, themselves have a broad definition, and we'll go over those shortly. The impacts that have been prioritized for this RP are in bold here on the slide. And here is that same slide shown in Spanish. And I'm going to share my screen now to uh, give everyone a quick overview of where the core results menu and the um, core condition definitions and uh, impact statements are found. So if you look at the core results menu on DataShare, you see that the definition of each core condition and a header for the impact statement has been added to help make that distinction between these community level impacts or results um, and the broader core condition that they are associated with. So we can see here, lifelong learning and education is defined as high quality education and learning opportunities from birth to the end of life. For this RFP, the prioritized impact is about equitable access to high quality education and learning opportunities from birth to end of life. And so um, the age range is built in uh, via that definition of the core condition. For thriving families, right down here, we see it defined as safe, nurturing relationships and environments that promote optimal health and well-being of all family members across generations. And for this RFP, there are two prior prioritized impact statements under that core condition, um, and they are increased resilience of children and youth, and that's defined by the county as ages 0 to 24, and increased resilience among older adults defined by the county as age 60 and older, and dependent adults, which is defined by the county as adult, as adult aged 18 to 60 with physical or mental limitations that restrict their ability to carry out everyday activities or to protect their rights. And at last, but certainly not, not least, we have healthy environments. The Healthy Environments Core Condition, which is defined as clean, safe, sustainable, natural environment and a built environment and infrastructure that support health and well-being. Um, and so we encourage you to think of environment as things that exist in nature, as well as things created by humans. And so for this RFP, the prioritized impact statement is safe, affordable, accessible recreational spaces which might be related to the natural environment, such as our beaches, forests, rivers, et cetera, 
or the built environment created by humans, playgrounds, recreational centers or facilities, bike paths, et cetera. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and just click one of the impact statements. And you can see a list of indicators associated with each impact statement. Um, and we want to uh, clarify for, for you all that you are not required to use or cite the specific community level indicators that you see at DataShare. Um, you, you can use them and cite them in your proposals if they're relevant to what you're doing and help you make your case. But if there are other indicators or other data sources outside of data share and outside of this uh, core results menu or this list of indicators within a certain impact statement, um, if there are other data sources outside of those that are more relevant and useful to you, you can and certainly should use those. Okay. So we'll go ahead and go back to the slides in just a moment here. And we do see your questions in the chat and we'll um, get to those in just a moment. And so um, before we dive in more to the uh, content of today's uh, training, we wanted to go over a couple questions that are asked really commonly um, in the TA sessions and trainings we've done with you all. And um, in just a moment, Nicole will share her screen with those. And are those you, questions um, are, yeah, you see it now. Maybe it's, you know, I was wondering, maybe it's just my settings. I, I don't see it, so I apologize. But do others see it? OK. OK, great. Apologies, Nicole. Um, OK, so the two questions that are that come up a lot and were um, they were asked and addressed in the Q&A document released by the county. Um, they are how broadly are um, or narrowly the condition statements will be interpreted and or how much a program needs to align with indicators in the core dashboard, also known as the core results menu on data share. And the county responded that it is up to the applicant to demonstrate the connection between the core condition and impact statement selected and your proposal. So it's up to you to demonstrate that connection. And again, the indicators listed on data share uh, may be included in proposals, but should not be considered the sole source of data or information about the core conditions and impact areas. They're really there as a starting point or a list of examples. Um, and they're certainly not comprehensive and should not be considered the only source of information. All right. With that, um, we do have those questions in the chat. And we also want to just pause and ask if there's any questions in general about the RFP overview um, before we move on to cover highlights from prior trainings. Crystal, do you want to address the questions that came up in the chat, or would you like me to do that? Yeah, why don't we, um, we can certainly tag team Nicole, so um, I can help, I can see here, it looks like Elaine, you asked, the Thriving Family section branched off into two children or adults, can you speak on this since we have to choose one or the other? Would you like to take that one, Nicole? Yeah, and I guess I'm wondering, Elaine, um, if you are willing to come off mute, do you want to say more about um, 
what it is that you are thinking about or kind of where, because it's, you know, as, as Crystal said earlier, it's, it's really up to each applicant to decide which one uh, they want to apply under. Um, and there's nothing, there's really nothing that would stop you from, from submitting uh, multiple proposals. If you have a program that um, focuses on increased resilience for children and youth and a program that focuses on increased resilience of older and dependent adults, you just can't, you know, submit like the same proposal under two different uh, core conditions and impacts. And so it's really kind of a matter of uh, kind of thinking through what is that program you're proposing? What are the activities? What are the outcomes? What's the population that you anticipate serving? And when you look at all of that together, which of those um, impact statements and populations does it feel most closely aligned with? So maybe Thank I'll you. just pause there to see, does that help Elaine? Or is there something else that you were wondering about or would find helpful to hear in response to your um, question? No, no, that helps. I, I was just surprised they had split it because when they talk about families, to me, it was the youth and the adults together. And so it became a little confusing when it when I came across it and it was split. I was like, hmm, mm -hmm. it kind of changes things. So but mm -hmm. thank you for what you shared. I, that's, that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. And Christine, I see in the chat that you um, think that we've answered your question already, but might be still uh, worth to say it out loud so that we have it on the recording as well. Um, that the question was about the links that we're in the RFP um, after each of the core conditions and impact statements that were listed and those links were not active. They didn't actually go anywhere. And so the question was, where do those links go? And so they they lead to the data share, the core results menu on data share that Crystal was just showing us. Um, and so they, they basically lead directly to um, the impact statement for each core condition, and then the shows you the examples of indicators under each one. Are there any other questions about the RFP in general, the core conditions, the impact statements, basically anything we've covered so far before we move on to do the recap of the trainings we've done? Oh. That was not <laughs> supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So why don't we go ahead and move on? Um, I'm gonna share some highlights from each of the RFP related trainings that we've conducted, um, starting with the one on developing a theory of change and logic model with an equity lens. So as I do this recap, I'm only going to be touching on a few of the key concepts and tools or resources that we shared in each training. So it's not going to be a real in-depth how to, uh, you know, how to do these things. Basically, we want to give you a sense of what was covered in each training. Giselle will be sharing the links to the pages on the core resources website, where if you want to then watch the recording later, uh, download the slides, look at any of the handouts or other resources we share that you have all of that available. Once I finish reviewing the highlights, then we'll, we're aiming to leave enough time or plenty of time for any additional questions and answers. Uh, again, feel free to post them in the chat as we go along. And then we can always go back and review more uh, specific things in more depth if there were any concepts or tools that you hear me mention during these highlights that, that you want more information on. Okay, so developing a theory of change and logic model with an equity lens. Uh, we started with this because we think that if you do this as a thought exercise, especially with coworkers or colleagues, that it'll help you answer a lot of the questions in the RFP or in the application. So again, you're not required to submit a theory of change or logic model but going through this thought process can really help you then put the pieces together as you're preparing your applications. So a theory of change is helpful because it helps you answer the why part of this question. What are you doing and why? Uh, so in the training, we walked through the main components of a theory of change, 
meaning the problem or need and how you use data and stories to describe needs and strengths. That's part of uh, doing that with an equity lens. Another component is the context where, you, again, if you are thinking about how to do that with an equity lens, you're describing some of the root causes of the problem, the needs, the challenge, the barriers, right, that you've described in that problem or need statement. And it's more than just um, root causes in terms of uh, kind of personal or individual uh, causes, but really looking at what are some of those systemic barriers, some of those structural barriers, whether it's policies or systems, kind of the, the social environment, right, that is, that is creating those inequities or disparities. And then the third part of a theory of change are the solutions. Like, how are you going to address those inequities or what are the solutions or ways to address those inequities? And how can that be done by building on the strengths of individuals, of families, of the community, of partners, et cetera, et cetera. And in each step of this process of building a theory of change, it's helpful just to be asking, what data do you have or will you need to support your theory of change? So again, you start by thinking about and identifying and describing that societal problem or need that you are um, noticing or wanting to uh, address and doing that with an equity lens by looking at and identifying who is experiencing it or affected by it. And are some people affected more than others in terms of um, being able to see inequities. And then describing the context, which is really your assumptions. So this is again, just a theory of change. Uh, so these are your assumptions about, again, why that problem exists. What are the causes, contributing factors, systemic barriers? but to not just focus solely on kind of the problem side of things, but to also look at what are the, again, the strengths or the assets, sometimes it's called protective factors that could really help address, minimize, eradicate uh, the problems and the systemic barriers um, that you're concerned about. And then again, your solutions, your hypothesis about effective strategies and programs and practices. Okay, so those are pieces of a theory of change. A logic model is a good companion to a theory of change. Sometimes they actually are integrated into one document or one visual. Uh, but the simplest way to create a logic model is really just to ask a series of if-then questions. So if we have these resources, and another name for resources is inputs, to do these activities for these participants, and activities and participants are also called outputs. It's the thing that happens when you have the resources. Then we expect, want, and hope to see these short-term, intermediate, and long-term changes. So those are the outcomes, the changes uh, that you uh, expect to see, would want to see as a result of the activities that you're conducting. So, when you create a logic model in this way, it helps you answer the part of the question, what are you doing? So what are you doing and why uh, a logic model and a theory of change help you answer those together? And you can develop a logic model by going from left to right, like I just did, going from inputs to outputs to outcomes. Or you can do what we call backwards mapping doing it the opposite direction, starting on the right-hand side and then working towards your activity. So starting with the long-term outcomes or impact that you're hoping to influence. Uh, and in this case, we're using youth or life, college and, and career ready. That's kind of like that aspirational, maybe even slightly out of reach um, outcome or long-term impact you're hoping for. And then asking yourself, okay, so if, youth are going to be ready for life, college, and career, then they would need to be able to do what? And so you can see that we just uh, have a placeholder here to insert what is that behavior or that skill or that thing that youth would need to be able to do in order to uh, be life, college, and career ready. So that might be more like your intermediate outcome. And then thinking, okay, if, if youth are going to be able to do this behavior or have that skill, then they need to first be able to know, understand, or be able to do X, Y, Z. 
So this might be more like your short-term outcome. And the short-term outcomes are often the things that are more feasible to measure and to demonstrate that that change happened as a result of the activities or services you provided. And so that that's the last part of this backwards mapping. So if youth are going to increase their knowledge about XYZ, then they need access to whatever the activities and services are that you're proposing. All right, so it can go either way. Sometimes people find it easier to do that backwards mapping. But again, the idea is that together a theory of change plus a logic model, however you do it, however you know formal or informal or structured or unstructured it is, that just going through that thought process can really help you then have the pieces that you need to make your case for a program or service that you're proposing. And so that's why we covered that segment first before we did the next training, which was on developing a statement of needs and strengths with an equity lens. And so that training really focused on some tips and resources for thinking about how do you go about preparing that statement of needs, needs and strengths, which is really uh, speaking to why, why do it? Why do, why do the program or thing that you're proposing? And one of the areas that we focused on specifically in this training was this notion of asset-based framing. Um, and we used examples from uh, a document called Amplifying Our Voices, a language guide for advocates, care providers, policymakers, and families that the First Wife Center on Children's Policy created. Um, and even though that particular guide, uh, the, a lot of the language focuses on younger children or families with younger children, really the concepts apply to all types of issues and, and populations. And so these are just some reminders of, of the ways that the words and the language we use uh, in proposals and really anywhere else um, can themselves communicate important aspects of our approaches and our organizations. So again, this isn't something that you'll be necessarily scored on or that's a requirement in RFP, but that we are really recommending because it's very much in line with the concepts of collective impact and equity. And so the tips here are to lead with shared values. So even though I just said that in theory of change, you're starting off identifying and describing a problem or, or need, that we want to make sure that when we're using asset-based framing, we don't just stay there in that problem or deficit uh, area, right? That we uh, can instead lead with uh, our shared values. So try emphasizing some of the common values, like a particular policy or a program that helps everyone do something we all care about, like supporting our family members. And another tip is to name the system causing the problem, um, that when you... Uh, use or describe data that shows disparities in health and well-being among different populations, that we don't just stay there in terms of talking about the, the deficits in people, but really name, you know, what are, again, those policies, those systems, those structures that are creating that disparity, that inequity in the first place. Um, another tip is to take an asset-based approach. So again, doesn't mean that we're ignoring the problem or sugarcoating things and pretending that it doesn't exist, but instead of just staying in that problem and deficit uh, you know, frame of reference that we're, we acknowledge that the problems or challenges exist, but that we also really emphasize and draw upon the assets and strengths and protective factors that exist. Another tip is to use people-centered language. So just remembering that you know people are more than the issues or problems that they're experiencing. So that means that we need to try to avoid defining people that way and kind of reducing them down to labels or, or adjectives. So for instance, using phrases like people with diabetes, meaning they happen to have that condition it's just one aspect of their life instead of referring to them as diabetics you know, which implies that that's kind of all there is to them. And then the last tip is to avoid hedging, just meaning like use strong language, you know, uh, instead of saying we seek to strive to work towards, you know, kind of dancing around what we do, like just say like what it is that we're going to get done. So those are our asset-based asset framing tips. 
Um, and there were some examples that we reviewed in the training. These are all available in the slides from the training itself. If you're looking for ideas and I believe that we'll, um, yeah, on that page, uh, in the link that Gisela just shared for developing a statement of needs and strengths. If you click on that link, you'll actually see then a link to this resource that I described earlier, that amplifying our voices guide, where you'll see examples like these, where it kind of takes uh, some phrases that we might typically use or be really be really familiar with using that kind of language, uh, like at-risk seniors or vulnerable populations, and providing examples of how you reframe that uh, using these tips. Here's another just example of um, using people-centered language. Um, and, I, and I have to say that like, it's, a, it's a skill that I've continuously have to practice and remind myself of that instead of describing people or families as being vulnerable or at risk or low income, that it's families with incomes, families with low incomes, children and families experiencing challenging times or facing difficult experiences or adults who have experienced trauma or other challenges. And then these are some of the resources that we shared during that training. Again, you'll find them all uh, in the training page as well. Okay, the next training that we did was on developing your programmatic approach and evaluation strategy. Um, again, the content we covered here was really meant to help applicants think about how to how to go about responding to the questions in these sections here in the RFP, your proposed approach, what should be done, and who do you intend to serve. And uh, as you probably have figured out by now, we are big fans of creating a theory of change and a log and a logic model. And here we were suggesting that you know if you've done that thought exercise, um, that that can and should help you be able to answer the questions in the RFP <clears throat> about what should be done. Those are questions six, eight, and 10, as well as who do you intend to serve, questions 11 and 12. We also did a brief demo of this, uh, one of the core tools that we've created. It's, it also lives on the DataShare platform. It's a strategies and programs outcomes tool. And I'll switch to my other screen for just a moment, just to show um, this is what I'm talking about, that if you go onto the DataShare platform, you'll see this strategies and programs outcomes menu, which I think Gisela will put that link in the chat as well, um, where if you're just looking for, it's mostly helpful if you're trying to think of like suggested phrasings or you know, you're thinking, well, we do this. How do I describe that? How do I describe what we do? Or how do we? So this is really just meant to provide some sample language as you think about how to describe what it is you do and for whom or with whom. So depending on where you're focusing your efforts, is it with people? Is it with organizations and systems? These are some of the types of strategies or kind of collections of activities. So each of these is expandable and then program outcomes. So what are the types of changes you hope to accomplish in the short term? Changes in awareness, knowledge, attitudes and beliefs or skills, oops, as well as intermediate outcomes, intermediate and or long-term. So changes in behaviors, changes in status that often take more time or um, can sometimes be harder to measure, but can tell you if the um, knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs, and skills led to another type of change. So we covered that in the training, and that's something that if you are interested in learning more about that or need some additional guidance on, on that, uh, that would be a great use of um, TA sessions as well. Okay, so I just showed that. And then also in the same training, we reviewed how to use the core continuum of results and evidence. <clears throat> it's another core tool that we've developed that also can be found either on the core resources website or on DataShare. So this is the tool that you would want to refer to 
when you're answering question seven of the RFP uh, that asks you to place your program somewhere on this continuum. And so just remember you this, this answer, uh, this question is not scored, but you still need to be able to answer and uh, where your program that you're proposing, where it fits on this continuum. So in the training, we reviewed the, the points on the continuum and what they each mean. So emerging, meaning that the program hasn't been evaluated yet, but you're getting some positive anecdotal feedback that tells you like, oh, there might be something to this. Uh, for, uh, and then there's a good idea where maybe you've been doing something for a while and just have kind of an informal evaluation, meaning you're not necessarily doing it consistently or you're still kind of testing out you know, what questions you ask and how you ask them, but you're feeling like, well, the results we're getting show that there's, that it's promising, that there's some early progress and it's again, worth continuing to, to do this program, maybe refine it, uh, maybe even uh, move towards a more formal evaluation. The next point in the continuum being an effective practice where then this is a more formal or structured or consistent approach to evaluation where you actually identify you know what it is you're trying to evaluate meaning that you've identified some outcomes that you're trying to measure um, that you have a, a way to do that you have whether it's through surveys or interviews or other types of data collection that so that's what I mean by formal evaluation that you actually have a process in place to collect and analyze that data uh, and then evidence-based you know that's often um, the more rigorous kind of studies science, using a scientific method. Um, they don't always have to be something that appears uh, in a clearinghouse, you know, that lists all different evidence-based practices. Sometimes they do, but sometimes you just don't find them there. Um, but really it's like what distinguishes the evidence-based program from effective is just kind of the, the amount of evidence or data and how rigorous the evaluation and research was to be able to get to those outcomes where there is a statistical significance, meaning it wasn't just chance that uh, good outcomes <laughs> uh, were shown, but that there it really is um, uh, evidence showing it was that program, that intervention that led to those positive outcomes. Okay, so that was a lot, but that is what we covered in this training on, um, the programmatic approaches and evaluation strategy. We also talked about just different types of data and measurements or metrics and really distinguishing between process measures that focus on kind of how you go about delivering the service, which usually means like number of activities, number of services, number of people, um, kind of those output counts and how that's different from outcome measures that really are measuring, again, the changes that happen as a result of the activities, whether that happens in the short term, medium term, or long term. And that uh, the impact is, is like the ultimate change that we hope to see happens as a result of the activities and the outcomes. And oftentimes that longer term impact is the thing that is much harder to measure and say with certainty that our program caused that impact to happen, but it's still helpful to be thinking about what is that longer term vision, uh, that ultimate goal uh, that you're working towards. And you know, you've heard us talk a lot about logic models and you may have seen that in the RFP, they use the, uh, the phrase results-based accountability. So even though there's slightly different terminology, what we wanted to show is really they're asking the same kinds of questions. And so we did kind of this overlay of a logic model and, and results-based accountability or RBA, where RBA asks questions like how much was done. And so that's, that's what we would think about in terms of outputs, like the activities, unduplicated participants. Uh, in RBA, there's, um, uh, quality measures, how well were services provided. And so you'll actually see that in the RFP, you'll be required to say, you know, if you're funded, you'll be required to administer a uh, participant satisfaction survey. I think that's just one question in the survey, but to measure satisfaction, measuring quality. 
And then outcomes in the RBA language, it's basically asking, is anybody better off as a result of the programs and activities that you provided? Another key concept to really uh, pay attention to and, and remember as you're preparing your applications uh, that you have to write your three outcome measures as smarty outcomes. So we talked in this training about how to go from like smart outcomes to smarty outcomes. So smart, some of you may be familiar with this acronym, stands for, uh, actually there's different ways the S is used, either specific or strategic. The M is measurable. The A also has different, uh, can stand for different things, ambitious, achievable, or action oriented. The R is realistic and the T is time bound. So that's your smart. So you want to make sure that as you're crafting your outcomes um, that you could break, you know, like if you were to break it out, you could see like, okay, here's what makes it specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, time bound. And then the IE part comes from um, adding language that makes it inclusive and equitable. So we reviewed an example of how to do that. We shared a worksheet that is created by the management center that kind of uh, helps, again, go from a smart goal or outcome to a smarty. So the example here is uh, building a volunteer team of 100 door-to-door -door volunteers. So that is um, that is specific, you know, exactly what it is you're trying to do. It's measurable because you're, you've are you set a target of 100 uh, canvassers or, or, you know, it could be some other number. Um, and you might make the argument that it's realistic because let's say you are an organization that, that has done this before, or maybe you have a track record of do it, doing it. It's time bound because there's a, a time frame here, you know, by May. And then when you add the focus on recruiting people of color first, so they help shape the canvassing and, you know, future activities, uh, that's that, those are the pieces that help make it uh, a smarty outcome or a goal versus smart. Um, one thing that we did mention in the training is to make sure that as you're phrasing your smarty outcomes, that they actually are outcomes that focus on the change or the results that you'll be measuring, not just that you're focusing on the process or the activities or what you intend to do. So saying that because um, this example here, it's a little bit processy. Um, and so the, you know, as you think about how you craft your outcomes, that's just something to uh, keep an eye on. Again, we shared some resources during the training. These are all listed and linked on the training resources page that Gisela has posted in the chat. Okay, we did a couple more trainings. Uh, the next one we did was, was on finding and using community level data on data share and other sources. Again, this is basically circling back to the statement of needs and strengths, the why do it, because again, there are some specific questions and things in the scoring rubric that have to do with, with data. <clears throat> and we started with um, offering a definition or reviewing the definition from the RFP in the glossary about what we mean by <clears throat> community level data or community wide indicators. So in the RFP glossary, it says that uh, community level data is a specific quality or state that can be measured across a population group, community or geographic area rather than an individual. So typically that means that this is broader than what you might be measuring and collecting data on at a program level in terms of your participants that you're working with. And so it's important to remember that because community level data by definition is tracking something that's happening in an entire community, it means that the data are usually things that is, are more than what any one organization or agency can accomplish or change alone. So it means it's not just up to you to move the needle on community level indicators like the ones that you see on data share, but as part of describing the why do it and making your case for your program in that statement of needs and strengths, it is important that you can describe how your program and activities would, would contribute to improvements in a community level or community-wide indicator 
that's related to the core condition and impact statement that you selected. So that is why we recommend going through that exercise of creating a theory of change and a logic model for your proposed program, because that is often what helps you kind of connect those dots. We also review different types of data, both quantitative, you know, basically the things that you can count and the qualitative data or descriptive data. They both have value. Uh, when we're talking about community level data, um, think of that as quantitative data, like counts or percentages that can help you understand or describe how many people or what percentage of the population is experiencing that quality or state of well being or the absence of it, the percent change in community level indicators of well being over time, or the percentage difference between groups, meaning if there are disparities when you break the data down by race, ethnicity, gender, geographic area, et cetera, the quantitative data can help um, paint that picture. Qualitative data, again, are things that can help you understand, explain uh, why a need or inequity exists in the community and how change happens, and uh, also to understand participants' experiences in the broader community voice. So we reviewed like different ways to find community level data in the core results menu on data share. Also showed other ways to find data on data share. There's um, different places that you can look. And you know, data share is a great starting point, but as Crystal said earlier, it's not the only place and certainly not the only way. And you're not required to use or cite data from data share in your application. So if you find that community level data are not available on data share that would be helpful to you, you can use other sources uh, and other types of data uh, in your applications. So we reviewed a few of those uh, for each of the core conditions. We can share that um, later to show you like the Google Doc with the links to other resources that we shared. And we welcome other suggestions too. We can add those to that document. And then we gave some tips for citing data when space is limited. So, uh, it, you know, because there are character count limits in this application, it just means you have to get creative about how to convey the important parts of a data source or citation so that whoever's reading your proposal knows that you're citing reliable information and sources. And that's actually a term that's also defined in the RFP glossary. And it means information or sources of data whose origins and methods can be verified or is produced by an entity with a history of producing accurate information related to social services and policy. So just in whatever way you can, we, we recommend trying to include like the author or the creator of the original data source, the year, the title of the data, uh, and try to weave that into your narrative so that again, if anyone wanted to look it up, that they could, that they know it's, it's more than just, you know, someone's opinion or hypothesis. Okay. And then the last training, the one that we did earlier this week was on preparing a budget program budget and budget narrative to address these last parts of the application here. We talked about how important it is to, you know, kind of be working on your budget at the same time or kind of go back and forth between preparing your narrative and your budget to make sure everything is in alignment so you don't get to the end and realize, oh, wow, what we proposed is very different from the budget that we would need. And now we need to go back and rewrite our <laughs> proposal. So do it, uh, do it simultaneously. Um, there are specific questions in the questions and answers document that HSD posted that have addressed some of the budget related questions. And basically the county has confirmed that when you're preparing your budget template and the leveraging template, um, you are applying for um, equal amounts each of the three years in the funding cycle. Okay, and then also the amounts that you see listed in the RFP by tiers in terms of like, you know, the max, minimum and maximum amounts you can apply for, those figures represent the amounts per year, per fiscal year of the three-year cycle. We walked through the budget template and the leveraging template uh, and reviewed the examples that the county provided. Again, you can download those, those templates from HSC's website. They've been updated to make some corrections that uh, actually got noticed during some of the trainings. 
and we can walk through any of those today if, it, if it's helpful. There were a couple things, couple questions that came up in the training or right after the training that we felt we needed to get clarification on from the county just to make sure that we were giving accurate responses. So uh, we did we did get confirmation that we were, confirmation that we were sharing the right information. So we thought it might be helpful to share that here today just to make sure everyone uh, has access to this information as well. So one of the questions that came up was a question about whether payroll taxes should be included in the personnel total in the budget template, or should that be considered part of the administrative overhead? And so basically the answer is, if you as an agency or in your program, if you include payroll taxes when you're calculating fringe benefits, um, then the amount of the payroll taxes associated with any program or project staff that you've budgeted for, those can be included in the personnel costs. They don't have to be administrative overhead. So just the key here is if you've listed and, and included as, as line items specific program or project staff that are have a direct role in that project, then any of the salaries, the benefits, the payroll taxes, all of that can be included in the personnel costs. If you have, for instance, management or administrative staff where they're not directly involved in implementing your program, it's like you know your accounting staff or HR staff, um, any of their you know proportion of their time or costs would be that would be part of the administrative overhead. So that was one of the questions. The other question that um, was asked <clears throat> and answered after the training was um, trying to get clarification about rent and utilities. So the question was, can the rent and utilities line item be used to request office rent and utilities for space that project staff will be conducting work out of, meaning they're doing one-on-one -on -one intakes or case management or meetings with clients or working on their case plans and reports? Or can that line item only be used to rent you know, for the cost to rent space for events and special activities, which is kind of how the example in the budget made it look like. And so the answer is, if the use of the space can be directly tied to the program and project activities, then the rent and utilities item can be used to request funding. Um, but it just means that's really important that you as the applicant are explaining how you calculated those costs so for example, did you allocate a portion of the rent and utilities based on the FTEs assigned to the project? Uh, and then also explain the reason for the line item and the relationship to the program operations in that narrative description column in the budget. So just make sure you explain, explain, explain. And then if the use of the space is more general and cannot be directly tied to the program or project activities, then that would be considered administrative overhead. So for example, like your administrative offices. Okay, that was the tour, the highlights from the trainings we've, we've conducted so far. So I'm going to pause here and um, I think Crystal, maybe I'll ask for your help with going back through the chats to see Absolutely. if there were specific questions that came up that we can help answer. Yeah, there was one question, Nicole, that came up from Denise going back to the core continuum. And she asked if, for example, we use an evidence-based curriculum in our education, then do we mark our program as evidence-based? Yes. Yes. If there is a specific element of your program that you're proposing, whether it's a curriculum, a specific practice, you know, a, a, almost like a program within your program, if that, if there is an element of that that matches that definition of evidence-based in the core continuum, then yes, you can say what you're doing is evidence-based. You don't have to like have everything in your program uh, in your proposal fall under, you know, or match that definition of evidence-based. That was the only question in the chat so far. Okay. 
Well, then why don't we open open it up? And let me just ask Denise, did that answer your question for you? Great. See the thumbs up. Um, and I think I saw yeah. one from Nora. So that's next. Um, yeah. And she asked, do you recommend an annual salary increase in personnel? Um, if we do not include salary, or if we do not include salary increases, will that matter since the amount is the same each year? It is up to you as the applicant to decide how you want to handle salary increases. So it's true that yes, the, the amount that you're requesting has to be the same amount in each of the three years. And that actually is something that the reviewers will be looking for and, and considering uh, when they're scoring, they'll actually look to see if the amount is the same in the three years. So then it means that you'll have to kind of decide as you're preparing your narratives and then your budget um, how to make that work so that the amount is the same in the three years. So if you start with certain amounts in salaries in year one and you want to build in salary increases in year two and year three, then you have to look at, okay, where else, what else uh, can be different or less? What other line items could you budget less for in years two and three so that your amount still is the same each year? Mm -hmm. did that help Nora did that answer your question okay great it looks like we have two budget questions from Eliza are contract workers considered to be personnel or non-personnel they do not receive benefits, and in the past, we have not included them as personnel, but they do work directly on the project. Yeah. Um, typically, the personnel section of the budget really is meaning like your employees, person, you know, that kind of personnel. And so if um, you have contract workers that are like consultants or, you know, as you've described, um, you know, you're obviously paying them, but they don't receive benefits. They're not on your payroll. Those um, would probably fit under the professional services, you know, so non-personnel and then again, describe like what their role is. So even if they are working directly on the project, that's fine. Uh, and then just again, use that narrative description column or cell to describe what those contracts are for, what they do, make sure it's there's some kind of reference back to like the activities or the you know services that they'll be working on that you know ideally you will you would have described in earlier answers to to the questions. Um, Hannah just asked in the chat, Nicole, if you can kindly repeat that. She had a personal interruption. Um, yeah, so, and I guess I should preface, preface that with, um, it is a judgment call that you'll have to make as, as the applicant, whether you put them under the personnel or non-personnel item, uh, cause sometimes I know the organizations do consider contract workers as personnel. So like, it's like, you'll have to make that judgment call as an organization, um, typically, uh, contractors, consultants, you know, that kind of uh, category are considered non-personnel. And so they might fit, uh, might fit under the professional services line item in the budget template. And then what I was saying was just make sure you're explaining, no matter where you put them, <laughs> explain, you know, what that cost is, um, and tie it back to the activities or services that you will have described in earlier questions. So it's again, clear to the reviewer that, oh, that contract for those, you know, contract workers or, you know, whoever they might be, it's related to this part of the program operations. 
Thank you, Nicole. Yeah. Um, another question from Eliza. It looks like it's related to the budget template. Are we allowed to change non-personnel cost items in column A of the budget template? Or do, we, or do these need to remain as is? For example, we do not have participant incentives or subsidies. We can replace with costs that we do have or remove these rows altogether in the template. That's a good question. I, I would suggest leaving the, the rows as they are. And if something doesn't apply, then you just leave that row blank. Um, if there's a different type of cost that you need to budget for and it doesn't feel like it fits under one of those existing cat, or I guess I would see like, see if, you know, see if it can, um, even if you don't call it that in your budget, like see if there's a, a line item that kind of matches as closely as possible in the budget template. And then again, use the narrative description to describe what that is. Those are all the questions we have so far. What else is coming up for okay. folks? Other questions come to mind or what are the things that you're, especially for somebody that are either still contemplating or you're in the, still in the kind of beginning stages of your drafting, are there particular questions in the RFP that you find yourself having to think through a lot or aren't quite sure where to go with it? Um, and just, I just opened up the budget template because I was trying to remember <laughs> off the top of my head what the categories were or the line items were under non-personal costs. And there actually is, uh, there's probably a couple different places. Uh, if you look at the template here. So if you're finding that some of the costs or things that you, you know, the way that you describe your line items in your agency budget, if they don't quite match up with how they're listed here in the budget template, you could probably use the rows like miscellaneous operating expenses or other um, and use those, those lines to include the costs that are important to you. And then again, just use that narrative description cell to describe what it is. One of the things we said in the training, um, and you'll it's you can see it a little bit better in the example, you know, there's as far as we can tell, there isn't a character limit or a space limit in the budget template and the leverage template. So not that not that that's an invitation or encouragement to write a lot <laughs> in these because you still want to make it easy for the reviewers to read and understand. But you can see that the cell will expand as you type. And so you're not limited to just like what you can fit in that small space right there. So just think of it as like what information would the reviewer need to be able to know and, and, and see to help them understand what you're proposing and to know that the costs, you know, are tied to, again, the activities and, and you know, program uh, design that you proposed versus you don't want to leave them wondering like what you know what is what is that cost related to and why is that important why is that needed yeah Denise I see your hand apologies I'm, I'm having some camera issues this morning um 
But the thing that I've been um, kind of stuck on a little bit with mine is that we have the option of different activities per year. But when we got the Q&A answers um, from the county, they said the outcomes need to stay the same. So we could have totally varying activities, but it has to have the same outcome. So I don't know if you have any tips or thoughts on advice for us around that. Um, hmm. Hold on a second, let me grab the, the Q&A document so I can take a look at that. It's in the section where we were asking questions about the online portal. Because on the online portal, you can break apart the activities by year. Okay, so me thanks to Sala for posting that in the chat. Because I think I'm going to open that up and share my screen so we can make sure we're looking at the same thing. Give me just a second. If that's helpful to find it. Okay. So this is, if anybody else is following along, this is page 23 of the QA document that was posted on July 8th. So yeah, it's question four. Because Denise, you were saying that you'll have different activities that will occur in different years, but that it sounds like the outcomes have to be the same across all three years. Yeah, it looks like there's no drop down option to do different outcomes per year. And then in, in reviewer, is there a space where you're right, where you're actually typing in your outcome? Yeah, you can put in your outcome. So the activities, you can break them apart by fiscal year, but in the outcomes, they give you one up to three outcomes. Mm-hmm. So you, I feel like even if you had multiple activities per year, you would have to have one outcome for those activities because you can only go up to three with your outcomes. So I don't know if there's any thoughts around that. I mean, we could just be more general maybe with our outcomes. I mean, I, my, my general thought about that is, yeah, since you're since everyone is limited to three outcome measures that you probably want to pick the three outcomes that you think are going to, you know, one, be the most realistic and feasible to measure, but that also really, you know, um, say something about the result or change that happened as a result of the activities that you're, that you're conducting. So even if you in, in reality measure like five outcomes, that of those five, what are the three that like um, will make the strongest statement, right? About the the impact or the effectiveness of the program. Okay. So there is that element of yes, you will have to choose three, and then um, I I feel like what the Q and A document was saying, and I just don't, I can't picture what how it's set up in Reviewer because I don't I don't have a, a Reviewer account, but I think if you are um, choosing your three outcomes, that each of the three outcomes, um, they could be specific to a particular fiscal year. And then I think in your outcome, like in the phrasing of the outcome, you'd have to make it clear if it was, you know, tied to just like, like it's only something you're going to measure in one year, okay. in, you know, in a particular fiscal year um, versus an outcome that you'll be measuring in all three years of the program. Okay. All right, thank you. Does that help? Yeah. What 
other questions are coming to mind? And I'll just say two, because um, I know sometimes it can be uh, awkward to <laughs> ask a question that, you know, maybe you're not even sure how to ask it or you're kind of embarrassed to ask it. And it's in a meeting that's being recorded for all to see <laughs> forever. So if, if any of you want to um, post a private message in the chat to either Crystal or me, uh, we'd be happy to We'd still read the question, just so we'll say who it's from, and then we can do our best to answer it in the moment. Okay. This one's asking for um, just another round of that explanation to fully understand the last point I was making about outcomes across the years. Um, so you can, so you, you know, every applicant, you, you're basically being asked to propose up to three outcomes that you'll be measuring, um, you know, in your, in your program. And so depend, I think what the county is basically saying is like, depending on how you are implementing your program, there might be some activities that you only do in, uh, you know, certain years of this three-year grant. Like maybe it's activities that you're only doing in year one of the three-year grant, and then you're done with them in years two and three. So when it comes to the activities, you are, you can say like which, fiscal years of this grant, those activities will happen. And then similarly uh, with your outcomes, you can then say, okay, this, you know, outcome one, um, we are measuring in years two and three, fiscal years two and three of this grant, because we need that first year for startup activities. We won't be ready to measure until years two or year three. So you can, you can, you can say in your proposals, like what fiscal years you'll be measuring those outcomes. Um, and so my suggestion was then when you are entering in or typing in the outcome statements, the Smarty outcomes in your, in reviewer, the online application portal, just make sure it's really clear if it's an outcome that you're only measuring in a particular year or years of that three-year grant. Did that help clarify? Helped me, Denise. <laughs> Great. Um, and I'll just say too that like, cause I know that some of you have signed up for the individual TA sessions, others, uh, I, I don't remember if you have yet. Um, if you're also finding that like, you're hearing answers here and you're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And then once you get down to the writing, you're like, wait, no, that makes sense. No sense at all. Uh, that's a great use of the individualized TA sessions to actually kind of talk through your specific um, drafts and scenarios, and we can help uh, help brainstorm. Any other questions? Okay, well, I think our we will stay on for a little bit longer just in case anyone does uh, want to ask a few more questions, but also we are going to finish up with just a few tips for getting across the finish line. And so I'm gonna hand it back to Crystal to review those. Thanks, Nicole. So some quick tips as you're starting to work on or finishing up. Um, so first one, read the questions carefully, of course. Some questions have multiple parts. So make sure you, quote, understand the assignment. And this is a big one. Um, compare your responses to the scoring rubric. And Nicole touched on that earlier. 
Um, but looking at those exemplary scores and what the review panel will be trained on, and it'll help you recognize which questions have multiple parts. Um, and again, what the reviewers will be instructed to look for. And so we often call this think like a reviewer. So you're viewing and scrutinizing your own application and writing through the lens of that reviewer. Another one, write as though the reviewers know nothing about your program. So don't assume that you'll get reviewers who are familiar with your work or your program or the issues or inequities you're proposing to impact, or even that they'll be well-versed in core, core conditions, equity, or collective impact, or things of the like. So again, write as though you're speaking to someone brand new who doesn't know about your program. Build in some time for internal and ideally external reviews and technology glitches. So um, have a fresh set of eyes on your drafts. Compare, again, compare your responses to the scoring rubric. Don't wait until the last minute to start entering your responses into the online portal. Assume there will be glitches, even just this past example we came up. Not necessarily a glitch, but something that came up as a surprise in terms of how things are being entered. So build in time for that. Um, and also anything that might be a user error or, or an overloaded system. Um, if someone else on your team is going to be responsible for entering things into the online portal, have them practice logging in and enter fake placeholder data now so that they're familiar with the flow of the system. And then, of course, make sure they've replaced all the placeholders uh, with um, real text, your actual responses, and the uploaded documents. Um, of course, double and triple check your grammar and your math. The scoring rubric doesn't award or take away points for spelling and grammar. Um, you don't need to be a professional grant writer, um, but you can make the reviewer's job easier by trying to catch and fix those errors before submitting your application. And we do want to note uh, that there is a, but in the budget section of the scoring rubric, there is a specific mention about free of errors. So again, just double, triple check your spelling, grammar, and your math in your budget templates. And lastly, make use of the TA sessions that are available to you. Um, many of you have already signed up and have been attending. We, Nicole, uh, Nicole, Nicole, Nicole and I have really been in, uh, enjoying being in these sessions with you, being your thought partners and helping to navigate and demystify the RFP and application questions. If you haven't already signed up for your first TA session, we encourage you to do that as soon as you can, ideally by, by the next week, July 19th. After the 19th, we can't guarantee that there'll be enough space um, and that the core consultants can accommodate new requests. That's it from me. Thank you. Back to you, Nicole. Thanks, Crystal. And we're actually going to do um, a, instead of the QR codes today, we're going to, for those of you that are still here, we're going to ask you to fill out our uh, feedback survey on a Zoom poll today. And then for anyone that has already laughed or doesn't have a chance to fill it out right now, we'll send it as a survey monkey link. But um, we really appreciate uh, being able to see and, and review the feedback on all these trainings and TA opportunities. It helps us know like what's been helpful. Even though this is the last training, um, there are things that, you know, if we can identify ways that we can offer uh, additional support or even be of more assistance, especially during the TA sessions, um, that would be helpful feedback for us. So if you wouldn't mind taking a moment before you uh, leave today's session to fill out the feedback poll, we'd greatly appreciate that. And again, we will hang out here for a few more minutes in case anybody has additional questions. Um, but if any of you need to leave after you've done the survey, I just want to say thank you very much for spending your, your morning with us, for being here. And we wish you uh, all the luck in the world with your, uh, with your applications and getting over that finish line. Thank you to Stella and Gisela uh, for providing stellar bilingual assistance as always. And thank you, Crystal, for being a fantastic co-facilitator. <laughs>